Excellent. Okay, so before we start today's lecture, just a quick preamble of things. So I now have a uh, a Google form for the uh, for attendance that should now be available. I should also have all of our lectures on YouTube, which I posted both those things in the Discord currently. So you can go to either of those links throughout the semester. Well, the attendance link will change over the course of the semester, but they. Uh, but the YouTube link will stay the same. So with that said, the last topic that we had, let's see, uh, I want to say that the zombie apocalypse has a tentative due date of Thursday. I'm going to push that back to next Thursday it's because we're going to finish discussing what you need to know to be able to complete that homework. And that'll give you a full week to actually implement that homework and flesh in your own uh, options on it. So before I start today's lecture, is there any questions? And then probably uh, today or tomorrow, I'll grade the first homework. So you'll, you should get your first homework grade uh, uh, inside of Moodle as well. Excellent. So last time we, so, so far, we've really been spending a lot of our time talking about the building blocks for algorithms in Java. And so we identified that the five basic building blocks are output operations, storage operations, input operations. It's our processing operations, which are like our operators, like arithmetic or relational operators or equality operators or um, concatenation operations or logical operations. And then finally, Starting last lecture, we started to talk about the fifth and final building block, which is the control operations. And we said that the control operations can split into one of two styles of control. So up until we introduced the control operations, your algorithms were completely sequential. You executed each statement one after the other. But what control operations affords us is the ability to make decisions while we're executing our algorithm to be able to skip over statements or select a block of statements from a collection of statements, or it allows us to repeat a block of statements or block of code. So we've seen the selection statements where we did a single selection, a double selection, and a multi-selection. So in today's lecture, I want to show you how to do the repetition statements or where we're going to be able to take and, a, uh, and repeat a block of code some number of times until we hit some kind of terminating condition. Okay, so let's see. We just did a quick review of our last lecture that we talked about. And yep, and so control operations, we're going to do repetition. Okay, so let me do this actually. You can see this being problematic for me. So repetition statements are responsible for repeating a set of instructions or a block of code within a program. So an example of our repetition statements in, in terms of our recipe algorithms, which is what I like to keep harking back to, since I think that that's one of the most intuitive models that people are familiar with in terms of how we program something is uh is actually pretty common so it would usually take the form of something like stir the batter until there are no more lumps right so that represents an instruction you might follow in a recipe where you repeat that action that action is to do a single stir but then you will continue that action until the terminating condition occurs and in this instance the terminating condition would be when your batter is no, no longer lumpy. So, so long as there are lumps, you continue to stir. So the action to continue stir, which changes the batter state, the thing that we evaluate to stop is the state of the batter. So our pseudocode will look something like this. While the batter is lumpy, we stir the batter, and that keeps going. So note that all control operations use Boolean values. We talked about that last time when we introduced the concept of selection statements that all the choices between our if else blocks required something to be either true or false. That's the same, that's the same case with our uh, Boolean, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, our repetition statements as well. 
So we'll only repeat based off of a yes, no, true, false uh, on our loop control variable. Okay, so when we're talking about repetition statements, there are generally two kinds of repetition statements you're going to see as you start to develop your software. The type we just saw in the sample I gave in terms of doing the in terms of evaluating the state of the batter was what's called a sentinel controlled. But typically you'll 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 either encounter a counter controlled or sentinel controlled. A counter control is typically you know ahead of time how many loops you need to perform. And so usually if we know ahead of time how many times we have to loop through, we'll use a for loop uh, structure. If we don't know ahead of time the number of loops we have to perform, how many times we got to repeat that code, then we use a while loop structure. And that is usually in the form of what we call a sentinel control. And so we'll take examples of that so that you get an idea uh, on the distinction of those two uh, in just a moment uh, in, in the next slide, in fact. So a quick thing I do want to highlight, though, is that uh, repetition statements always require three things. It requires a variable that controls the loop that's usually called our loop control variable. It requires an evaluation of the variable to determine if the loop's instruction should ex execute. And it also has to update the loop control variable such that it becomes false at some point. So every time you, you build a loop, it requires, make sure it has those three things. And again, we'll look at that in source code so you can actually see what's happening. So note, if you fail to update the loop control variable within the loop, so that it eventually terminates the loop, then you'll always be running that. So for instance, if we didn't give a terminating condition here in our pseudo code while the batter is lumpy, if, if we never change the state of the batter such that it never not becomes lumpy, we will be infinitely stirring that batter. So the same concept that we only stop when that condition becomes true, you have to understand every while loop or for loop works the same way. So always make sure that whatever you're evaluating to decide whether you're going to repeat the action or not eventually breaks out of the looping condition. Let's so let's take a let's let's take an example. Let's take a look at this. Okay, I'm going to copy this code and let's go over here. So the first example I want to show is going to be one that's our counter control loop. I want to compare and contrast it to the sentinel controlled loop. But usually when we show off uh, looping structures in programming classes uh, or just to junior devs, we start off with a counter control because it's very intuitive. Okay, so let's see. This is, I'll call uh, counter loop Java. Okay, so now that I have that, let's go ahead, open that here inside of my editor. Okay, so let's take a look what's going on here. Can everyone see the source code? Or do I have to blow that up some? Yeah. Okay, so let's take away the actual implementation first and let's look at just a uh, computer. Okay, let's stop. Not at all what I want. Let's go back. Okay, so first thing is let me cut out the main method and look at just what the comments have to say. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new class. So public class, and then I'm going to give this class name counter loop. And so recall that every time we define a new class file, new Java file, it has to share the same class name as whatever the file name is. So I call this counterloop.java. So it's going to have the class name counterloop. Then I'm going to open and close scope using the curly braces. And now I'm going to put some comments in there as reminders of what it is we require for any kind of looping structure in, in Java or, in fact, any programming language. So this, this is a pretty common theme, regardless of the the language you're programming in. So first, you must create a loop control variable that controls the loop. Two, you have to evaluate the loop control variable to determine whether you're going to execute the code associated with it or not. And then third and finally, 
and you have to update the loop control variable such that it becomes false in order to end the loop. Okay, so let's make a main method. So I'm going to create my main method the same way I've made every other main method for these examples. And so this is going to be the first part. Here, line six is where I'm going to create what's going to be my loop control variable. I'm going to call my loop control variable a counter to illustrate that this is a counter controlled loop. I'm going to default my counter to zero. So it's going to be an integer data type. Typically, all counter controlled loops are going to process across integers. And then here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a while statement. So a while statement is going to allow me to uh, evaluate a pooling condition and determine whether I should execute the block or not. So what has to resolve inside the parentheses of the wild statement is going to have to be a Boolean expression. So it's got to be something that resolves to be something that's true or false. So recall that the relational operator allows me to use numerical data and convert it into a Boolean response. So here, so long as counter is less than 10, I will do this block so then I can associate a block of code to this while statement. So notice that I associate a block of code to a while structure the same way I associate a block of code to an if or selection structure. The syntax is very similar. So then what inside of the block this only executes if the boolean expression resolves to be true. So if it does resolve to be true, I'm going to print out the state of my counter. And then I'm going to do the third criteria, criteria I need to do, which is I'm going to update the state of my loop control variable. And we're going to update the state of our loop control variable using that compound assignment operation we saw last lecture, where I can read the state of my variable. Currently, it's at zero the first time I would do this. I could then add one to whatever the state of it is. That's going to resolve to be a new numerical value. Zero plus one would become one. And then I can overwrite the current value of counter with the new value of counter. So then when I'm done and hit here, what's going to happen, the way that this is really distinguished between a selection statement is that then we jump back to line eight, where the while is expressed, and we reevaluate that Boolean expression. And if it's true, after we execute that block of code, we're going to execute it again. And we're going to continue to execute that block of code until our loop control variable becomes false or until the Boolean expression that's evaluated in the loop control variable becomes false. So let's take a look. And then finally, when all is said and done, after I exit the while loop, because the while loop ends here, right, where the scope of it ends, then I'm going to print out the state of my counter variable here on line 13. So let's take a look and actually run this and then play around with it just a little bit. So I'm going to compile that. So let's compile uh, Java C counterloop.java. And now let's run that. And so here we can see this is exactly what we'd probably expect a counter controlled loop to do. So the idea behind here is we're using the counter to step the value up of the counter for each iteration of the loop. So that's a common term that you might not hear outside of computer science is, is uh, uh, iteration. And iteration just means the execution of a while or for loop or do while loop. So any kind of looping structure, it's an execution of it once. And you can have multiple uh, iterations based off of what your loop control variable state is. So here, if we started at zero, well, each execution of our block will increment it by one. So here you're going to see our counter is zero. It executes our counters one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It gets all the way to nine. And that is when it stops because after nine increments to 10, this is going to resolve to be false because 10 is not less than 10. So we will stop executing that loop. And then finally, the reason why we do print out 10 is because of line 13. After we're out of the while loop, then we're going to go ahead and execute uh, that this, the ability to actually see what the final state of our counter variable is when we break out of that loop. So does this fundamentally, logically make sense to everybody? Is there any questions in terms of this looping structure? While was the time printed out? What's that? 
Why was the pen? So that because of line 13 here. So if so, let me comment this line out. So here I put a comment on line 13. And what you're going to see here is if I recompile my code, and if I rerun this, notice now it only goes to nine. And that's what we would expect, right? Because we start our counter at zero. And so long as our counter is less than 10, then we print out the state of it, and then we increment it, and then we do that action again and again and again until our counter is no longer less than 10. Now, the moment it's no longer less than 10, then we don't execute that block of code. And then we would just move on to the next group of statements after the while block. So in this instance, if I wanted to see the state of my counter after the while block was done, then I can do this printout. But notice it won't actually print out the value of 10 because it's got to be less than 10 to actually increment the block I mean, to actually do this, uh, this statement here. Now, just to show you, what do you think would happen if I make my counter equal to 10 by default? What do you think the, uh, the response of that's going to be? First of all, do you think that'll compile? Yeah. Okay, yeah, very good. Now, what will happen if I make my loop control variable 10? Because what's going to happen with my Boolean expression if my loop control variable is 10? Right. It's not so it's not it's going to skip past it. It's just it's it's going to resolve to be false. So it's going to execute my while block zero number of times. Right. So understand that the possibility with while loops and it's true for for loops when we look at for loops is that we can execute the, the code in there no times if the initial evaluation of that expression is false. And just to prove that concept, let's go ahead and run it and see. The only printout we get is the counter is 10, which is from line 13. So we've completely ignored this wild block because there was no reason to execute it. The condition that required us to repeat or even execute that block of code was never true. Okay, so let's try this. What do you think would happen? Let me put that back down to uh, zero. What do you think would happen if I comment out my update to my loop control variable. So here on line 10 is where I'm actually changing the state of my counter variable by one with each execution of that while block. That's gonna produce an infinite loop. That's exactly correct. Let's actually see what that looks like. Yeah, see, and since we never increment our counter, it gets stuck at zero, so it's always going to be less than 10. And so we'll never break out of that. And we'll actually have to force a breakout. Excellent. Okay, does ever have you covered this in lab already, this concept of while loops? Okay. Just out of curiosity, where are you at in lab? Um, paper speed, uh, oh, excellent. Perfect. So the next lab, you'll be doing selection and repetition statements. Very good. Um, yeah, so you're doing the one that's really focusing on data modeling and sequential processing operations, how to take an initial state, mutate that state, and produce it into some desired outcome. So I think that that's a really good lab. I know it's a challenging lab. If you're not used to data modeling and algorithm design, but it's one that will really strengthen your capabilities going towards that goal. Okay, perfect. Okay. And again, I would just want to highlight that this is a counter control because the thing we're controlling is counting up and down. I want to now contrast that with a sentinel controlled. Now, and so this will be my sentinel control. And so I won't spend too much time looking at the slide because what I'm going to do is I'm going to, we're actually going to play around with the source code. Now, the sentinel control loop, like I said earlier, is more in line with what my example was, where we were evaluating the state of the batter and then deciding uh, what we're going to do. So remember, I said one of the telltale signs of a counter control loop is you know ahead of time how many times you need it to execute. So for instance, in this instance, you knew before you ran this code that you're going to execute it 
How many times? So in the counter, on this counter loop, can you tell ahead of time how many times it's going to execute before I run it? How many people think you can tell how many times? How many people think that they can't? Does the question make... Uh, is, does the question make sense at least? Am I verbalizing the question in an appropriate way? So like how many, I guess, let me try to re-express it then. When I run the code we just looked at, how many times did it end up running? Do you remember what the output was? Huh? Well, when I, when I updated it here, so look at the current state. So my loop control variable is set to zero. My Boolean expression that I evaluate my loop express uh, my loop um, variable on my loop control variable on is so long as counter is less than ten, and then my update. Oh, thank you. Now, now my update is to increment my counter by one with each execution. So, with that amount of information, is it possible to predict the number of executions that's going to happen in this while loop? before we even execute it. Yeah, right? It's going to be 10, because you're going to start at zero, then you're going to increment that to one, and then two, and then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Once you get to nine and increment to 10, it's not going to run it anymore, because 10 isn't less than 10, right? Only up to nine is less than 10. So I know before I ever execute this, it's only going to run 10 times. And then I can test this out. We can we can do the scientific method, run this and see here, these are the 10 times. This this last time was out the, the while loop. Okay, that's what a counter controlled loop represents. So we know ahead of time. Let's compare to a sentinel controlled loop where we don't know ahead of time. And again, I'm gonna do the same thing. Let's take a look at what we're doing here and then we'll slowly build this out. So. In this instance, I'm going to import the scanner object of the scanner class so I can build a scanner object so that we can actually make this a little bit more uh, interactive. I'm going to define a new class. This one I'm going to call the Sentinel loop. And I'm going to add my same three comments because whether it's a Sentinel loop or a counter loop, a counter control loop, I still need those three basic criteria a loop control variable, an evaluation of the loop control variable and an update to the loop control variable. Okay, so now let's add in that main method. So in the main method here, oh my, let's uh, actually get some formatting in here. Okay, perfect. Okay, so here's my main method. It starts here and it's gonna end here. So inside my main method, the first thing I'm gonna do is on line 10, I'm gonna create a new scanner object and I'll call that input so that I can actually read data from the keyboard. And then I'm gonna create my loop control variable. In this instance, I'm going to just make it a Boolean value, right? It doesn't matter what your loop control variable is as long as your expression that you evaluate translates the response into a Boolean value. So here I'm gonna show you that I can actually just use a Boolean value to directly control one of my while loops. So notice here, since this is already a value that is either true or false, I don't have to use an operator on it. I could, if I wanted to, use a primitive operator and do this, right? I could do that, that's fine, but it's unnecessary, right? Because it's already something that is either true or false. So here, while repeat, the value of my variable repeat is true, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send a prompt to the user, enter Q to quit, then I'm going to use that scanner object I made, the input variable. It has that next method that returns the next piece of text that the user had supplied on the keyboard. Well, then I'm going to save that into a variable called response that holds a string data type. And then I'm going to use that dot equals method we talked about, because remember strings are a reference type. I'm gonna say if response dot equals Q, 
then I'm going to change the state of repeat to false. My, I'm going to change the state of my loop control variable. If it's not Q, then I don't change the state of repeat. So when all is said and done, after my while loop is done, I will then print just a statement to, so that you know that the, the while loop ends with the end. So looking at this, when does this while loop stop? When I press Q. And only when I press Q, right? So the question is, do I know ahead of time how many times this looping structure is going to execute before I execute before I run this code? No, right? It's not like the counter control where I could see and comp uh, and compute. I have all the information I know to compute the number of iterations. Here it's based off of what happens during the runtime of my application. It's impossible to know because there's not enough information for me because the thing that updates my loop control variable isn't supplied directly inside of the while loop. The condition is, but it requires the user to make that selection. That's what we mean by a sentinel controlled loop is that we have some sentinel value. In this instance, it's our repeat variable that will determine when the loop stops or not, as opposed to a counter controlled where it counts until it hits some specified number. And with counter controlled, I didn't illustrate this, but know that this is possible. You can count up or you can count down. I could have started my counter control loop at 10 and decremented it and checked so long as it was a positive number, continue the execution. So keep that in mind is that you can do counter control loops using any of the arithmetic operators. It doesn't have to be with just addition. You could do it with subtraction. You could do it with multiplication. You could do it with division. Okay, so let's let's test this out. Uh, this is the sentinel. Wait a second. Oh no. Whoops. I guess I should. Well, I never did make a. Uh, New Java file for that. Okay, so let's actually bring this here and let's copy pause to our code so I can actually run this. Save that. And here I can make this my counter loop again. Okay, perfect. No, nope, that's not quite my counter. That's my counter. Save that. Okay, so let's go back to the sense one. So let's actually run that. And, and so here I've entered Q to quit. So if I do Q right off the bat, that should terminate my while loop. But let's test that again and let's hit other things. So if I hit T, that's not a Q. So I'm going to repeat that loop structure. I'll do U. Yep, that's that's not a uh that's not a Q. Okay. In fact, let me do this. I mean, I can put everything in the stream at once. That's what the scanner does. So that's a highlight that I can actually put multiple characters in the stream because the delimiter with the next method, if you recall, is also a space. So what I did there is I inserted what? One, two, three, four, five, uh, a, about 10 letters or so until I hit the queue and then finally terminate it. Excellent. Does anyone have questions with that? Does everyone have a good firm on what's that? What happens if you like having queue and then a few other letters after that? Oh, that's a good question. Let's see. So in this instance, let's say I do R and then T and then Q and then W, then E, then R. It's only, it's gonna go to R and that's not a Q. So then it's going to grab the next thing from the input stream, which is going to be the T. And that's not a Q. So it's going to repeat that while loop. And then it's going to grab that Q from my input stream. And now that matches my loop control condition. So even though there's more things inside of my input stream that I could potentially read with my scanner, I'm not because I've hit the loop, the, the condition to terminate my loop inside of my code. So that stuff. So that stuff, though, so this WER that I've entered into the input stream never gets used for this application. Good question, though, because you get to see what happens with that. Okay. Is there any other questions? Is, is this pretty intuitive enough for everyone to understand? 
I guess really you get a great chance when you start doing the labs and the homeworks related to it is when you really get a chance to, uh, to see where the, the challenging concepts are. Okay, well, if there's no questions, I'm gonna move on. Okay, so there's three types of repetition keywords we can use. So far, I've only showed you the while keyword, um, but what I wanna do is I wanna show you the, uh, the distinction between a for and a while loop. Synt um, they, they only vary syntactically because behaviorally, a for loop and a while loop behave exactly the same. There's no difference between them. Uh, it's just the way that we can compress the logic. Recall that earlier in one of the prior slides, I had stated that typically for counter-controlled loops, we use for loops when we know ahead of time how many times we want to loop. And for the sentinel controlled loops, the ones we don't know ahead of time, we are going to use while loops. And you're going to see why that's the case in just a moment. Uh, but the big takeaway is when I say they're both the same behaviorally, it's with this, this line here inside the slide. Both for loops and while loops may execute the loop code a minimal of zero times. Right. So if the loop, if the Boolean expression on my loop control variable resolves to be false, then whether it's a for loop or a while loop, I might not run the block of code associated with the loop at all. That's an important thing to understand that you're not guaranteed to run that block of code. Okay, let's take a look at both fours and whiles. And here I have a big block of code that we can break apart. First things first, though, let me actually create the uh, file that we needed. So here we're going to create a while four dot java file perfect and then here let me go here oh here's in here it's kind of fun. okay so i'm going to do the same thing i did before first let me clear my terminal put this here Okay, so let me first start taking away things so that we can look at less code and move up to more code. So the first thing I do whenever I start any Java source code file is create a class name and name the class, the same thing my file name's called. So I called this while for, so I'm gonna create a class called while for. The next thing I'm gonna do until we learn how to make you, uh, our own custom methods is to create a main method and give that a scope to so open close parentheses. So this is the boilerplate code I need. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is let's just take a look at what we already know how to do. So I'm gonna cut up to here. So at this point, this is what we saw. This is a counter controlled loop using the while loop structure. So if you look, this is our loop. This is where we declare and initialize our loop control variable. Here's where we evaluate our loop control variable. And this is where we update our loop control variable. Remember, every looping structure requires those three things to happen. So in a while loop, notice how my initialization, my evaluation, and my update are kind of littered inside of the logic of my loop, right? So for instance, if this is the action I want my loop, is this if, if this is the statement I want my loop to do, in order for that to work, I'm kind of polluting the surrounding code space with the logic that governs the loop. Now, if I just run this, we can see that we'll get what we expect here, which is a counter control that starts at zero. It's the same thing that we did before, in fact. So let me do file four, and let me run that. See, the same thing that we had before, zero to nine, right? Okay. Let me show you how we can, in my opinion, improve that. And again, let me cut what's not necessarily there out. So this, to, com to compare it, would be the for loop structure. So the for loop structure, and I'm going to execute it first, and then we're going to break it down. You're going to see that the for loop is going to have the exact same behavior as the while loop. Notice on my output, it's doing the exact same 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Let's take a look at what's actually happening, though. So the keyword for a for loop is obviously for as opposed to while. 
but where in a while loop, the only thing that goes in between the parentheses is the Boolean expression, a for loop allows us to cluster the three criteria that all loops need, since we already know ahead of time how many iterations we want this loop to have into the parentheses. And so this prevents us from polluting the rest of our, our looping logic from what is actually happening inside of the body of the loop. So it makes our loop much cleaner uh, to read. So what I mean by that is the first, so notice there's sets of semicolons inside of the for loop because there's three actual statements happening inside of the for loop. The first statement is the initialization of our loop control variable. So here, where this was on, in its own line here, encounter is equal to zero or is assigned zero, I'm going to do it inside the parentheses. And then I'm going to terminate that end of statement so it actually happens. Then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define the Boolean expression that evaluates my loop control variable. So that's the only thing that goes inside the parentheses for a while loop, but that's going to be the second parameter, the second statement that I can put that's attached to my for loop. And then finally, inside of my loop body for the while loop, where I update my loop control variable, I can define that update as my third and final statement. Now notice that one does not have a semicolon. So the initialization of the loop control variable has a semicolon to end a statement so that we can process that action, so we can execute that action and move on to the next thing, which is to define a Boolean expression. And then once we've defined that, we say end a statement. And then finally, we give to the, our for loop the third and final thing it needs, but we don't end statement there because then we have to attach a actual block of code to it, just like anything else. But notice here, when we look at the what the for loops actual body is much more readable than the while loop because the while loop what I I keep saying this it pollutes the space because the only reason why we have line eight and the only reason why we have line five is to be able to control the logic of the loop so that's logic that works for the loop and not necessarily for our application so if you know ahead of time how many times you want your for loop to, I mean, your, your uh, loop to execute, you want to use the for loop because it's cleaner. I mean, would everyone agree that this is a cleaner way of expressing this logic here as opposed to here? I mean, fundamentally, it doesn't matter. You could do either of these the same way. But what motivated the concept of having a for loop to begin with and not just while loops is because it allows us to compress our logic and make it more readable. So are for loops always superior to while loops or do so for so for loops can only be used if you know how many how many times your loop has to execute ahead of time. So that's why so if it's a counter controlled loop, the advice is to use a for loop. And if it's a sentinel controlled loop, then you use a while loop. But if it is a counter controlled loop, for loops are superior for readability, because under the hood, a for loop is syntactically the same as a while loop. There is no performance boost for using a for loop or a while loop. They cost you the same computational time. In fact, they're doing the exact same thing. It's just the Java developers found it syntactically more readable to be able to take all of your looping logic, which is your loop control variable, the evaluation of your loop control variable, and then the update of your loop control variable and put that all in one line so it doesn't muddle what's actually happening in the body of your loop. And I think you'll, you'll see this more when we start doing examples of actual applications that do looping structures, especially with the homework. I know someone's uh, started on the homework and you probably see how the looping structures, you use both for loops and while loops in the homework, don't you? And nested for and while loops. In fact, what I want to show you is I can actually, to prove to you that a for loop is exactly the same thing as a while loop, I can format my for loop to look exactly like a while loop. So if you look at this third and final example, this is my loop control variable. I'm going to declare it 
before I declare my for keyword, the same way I did for my while loop. And so a for loop requires three statements inside the parentheses. So if I put an empty statement, so if I just do a semicolon, that's an empty statement. Then the second statement it always expects is going to be the Boolean expression that to evaluate the loop control variable. I'll put that the same way it appears inside of my while loop. And then the update, if I want to mimic my while loop from my for loop, I can actually do the update inside of the body of the code like so. So notice at this point, my for loop and my while loop look almost exactly the same. Just to highlight the fact that these are comparable to one another. But again, the suggestion is use for loops if you know ahead of time how many times you're going to uh, to uh, loop over the block of code because it's much more concise. Okay, is there any, and I can run this just to prove that this will run. Is there any questions related to this? Does everyone feel comfortable with the syntax of for loops and while loops? And again, the, the thing that tricks most people up with for loops is going to be the fact that you need to have three statements inside of the parentheses and not just the one. So that's kind of where it separates itself slightly. Okay, so finally, I wanna introduce the third and final version of a repetition statement, which is gonna be a do while loop. And the way that a do while loop is gonna distinguish itself from either a for or a while, because we stated those are comparable to one another. They're almost exactly the same. Uh, we use whiles though for code blocks that we want to repeat that we don't know ahead of time how many times we want to repeat them. So for sentinel control loops. Now, one of the deficiencies of a while loop is that we might execute the block of code associated with it zero times. So if you know that you want to execute the block of code at least once and then determine if you want to do it again, then you can use a do while loop for that instance. So a do while loop guarantees that the block of code associated with it gets, ex it gets executed at least once, and then it evaluates to see if it does it again. Whereas again, a while loop is zero times. It might never execute that a block of code. So let's actually look at that in practice. And again, So let's create a um, do file.java. Perfect. Let's clear this. Excellent. Okay, so let me do the same thing I did before. Let me cut away so that we are not looking at a huge block of code. So the first thing I'm going to do before I start doing anything is I'm going to create my class, do while. It's going to be named the same thing I named my .java file. Then I'm going to define a method inside of my class because if this is designed to be a Java application, all of my source code has to go into a method. And we need to have at least one method that is the main method if we want to execute it. So then inside of here, let's cut some of this out and look a little bit at a time so that we're cut here so here is what we've learned how to, what to do already so here we have a while loop and i'm going to print this statement before the while loop i'm going to create my loop control variable i'm going to set it to 10 then i'm going to create this while statement where i'm going to evaluate my loop control variable to see if it's less than 10 which it's, it's not, right? We could see that it's set to 10, so this isn't gonna execute. Now inside of here, if it did execute, it's going to print out the state of my loop control variable and then increment it. And then we're gonna print out this, uh, this text that says after the while loop. So let's save this and let's just see what happens when we run this. So we're gonna compile that and then we're gonna run this. Okay, so notice we have before the while loop and after the while loop. So we get these two print statements, but we don't get anything printed here because that while statement never executes, right? Because the loop control variable never resolves to be true. And we need its result to be true at least once to execute it at least once. So let's compare that to the do while. 
And again, let me cut this out here. So with the do while loop, which I'm going to now implement underneath my while loop, I'm going to print out a statement before the do while loop. And at the end of the loop, I'm going to print out a statement after the do while loop, just to let me know when it starts and ends inside of my console. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up a loop control variable, similar to what I did in the previous block. Here, I'm going to use the loop control uh, variable of J, and I'm going to assign it the value of 11. But notice, instead of opening with the while statement, we're going to open with a different keyword, do. And we're going to associate a block of code to the do. So by doing this, we can say, do this block of code, and then we're going to put the while after that because that's when we're going to then evaluate whether we do it again. So in a do while loop, the while actually goes at the end instead of the front. So here, this is going to print out the state of J, which is gonna be 11. Then it's gonna increment the state of J. So J goes from 11 to 12. And then at the very end, after we've executed that block, we're gonna evaluate and say, okay, if J is less than 10, do it again. And if it's not, then just exit out. Then, 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 then move to the next seat set of, uh, of uh, statements that are inside of this algorithm. And so where we didn't get anything in this implementation, we're going to get something in this. Let me save it. Let's actually run it. And here you can see we did get a printout here, 11. Now, this is super important. The... The while that's here is at the end of the statement. So we do have to put a semicolon to say this is the end of the do while statement. So this can look very weird if you don't register this as a do while loop. Because we never put semicolon up until this time, we never put semicolons after the if or the else or the for or the while, right? So this is the first time that we did something that's kind of strange like that. So if you ever see this in the wild where you have a while statement and you actually have the semicolon at the end of it, make sure that there's a do in front of it because that lets you know that that's a do while loop. So that is something that can trip you up because let me now show you this and get you to show uh, to compare. This is a common mistake that can happen. Notice here, what, am, what is this structure between lines 23 to 29 here? Is that, is that a while or a do while? That's a while loop, right? Because it starts with a while, it doesn't start with a do. So what happens if I have a traditional while loop and I do put a semicolon at the end of that? If I accidentally put my semicolon, if I, if I did something, I got confused with my syntax and I looked at my do while loop, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna put a semicolon at the end of my while loop, uh, the, the, the expression there. What, first of all, do you think that's legal? Do you think it's gonna let me uh, compile that? Again, there's only one way to uh, know, let's see. Let's try to compile that. Lo and behold, it lets me compile that. So that's super dangerous because that's probably not the syntax I want. So since that lets me compile, I'm going to be able to run this. What do you think is going to happen when I run this? I think everything inside is going to be ignored. Yeah, so everything, exactly. So remember, when I showed you with if statements, it's the same thing with while statements. If I don't have this block associated with it, and this block isn't associated, because remember, a semicolon says end of statement. So this block of code isn't part of this while, it's, it's after the while loop. So by putting a semicolon here, I bound an empty statement to the while loop. So an empty statement is gonna be the thing that executes indefinitely because we never update the loop control variable, right? So this is gonna result in an infinite loop. Do you see that? Because this is a valid statement. Just a semicolon by itself is a valid statement. It's an empty statement. So if we run that, it's gonna look like my console is just pause, right? And it is, because it's stuck in an infinite, infinite loop. And it's, it's stuck in an infinite uh, uh, loop where there's no print statements or anything. So it's just gonna hang until a control C out. And the reason why it's doing that, if you have code where it's just hanging like this, make sure you don't put a semicolon after your while keyword. 
The only time you can do that is if it's a do while loop. So please don't confuse that. That's a very common mistake that happens for uh, start uh, junior level developers. Okay. Okay, we talked about updating the loop control variable. Does anyone have any questions about that concept of being able to use those compound assignments? Do you remember that from last lecture? How, and again, all the compound assignments, we can use the plus assign or the plus equal, the minus equal, the asterisk equal, the division equal, the modulus equal, and the concatenation equal. All those are valid as compound assignments. Now, I think we did, so we did examples of that, didn't we, last class? Okay, and then I, we also talked about the difference between increments and decrements, the post-increment and the pre-increment. I only highlight that because it's really relevant when we're talking about repetition structures, because one of the necessary things we have to do with our loop control variables is update them. We have to read the current state and mutate it so that it eventually breaks out of the looping structure. So this is when you actually really do use those compound assignments in practice is is uh is usually in line with these looping structures like this so just making sure that we covered that and everyone is familiar with this and what's the difference between putting the plus plus before and after the variable name do you remember it's going to determine on whether it increments it before it does the rest of the statement or after remember we did the, the print statements where it printed the pre-increment, the original state, and then it printed out afterwards what the state was after that. And then in the post-increment, it, it does the, so pre-increment, it increments first and then does whatever else. So then we printed it out after an increment. It, in a, in a post-increment, it prints it out or does whatever we want to do with it. And then it updates the state. And again, go back now that those lectures are on YouTube, if it doesn't sound familiar, go back and listen and look at those, um, those examples. Okay, the last thing I kind of want to highlight inside of our repetition statements are going to be our uh, continue and break statements that we can put inside of our, loop our looping structures. So break statements allow us to break out of a code block. And so we'll see these break statements and repetition statements. We could also see them in switch statements, which I'm going to show you in just a moment. And then we continue statements allow us to stop processing the body of a loop and then continue to the next iteration. And we'll, we'll take an example of each of these so that you get an idea of what's happening. So let's go over here and actually do, this is what, the break, break.java. I guess I need a dot there. Okay, so okay, so let's take a look at this again. I'm going to do what I've been doing, where I'm going to cut out the implementation. So the first thing I'm going to start off with is declaring a new class called break, follows the same name that my break.java file is. And then I'm going to create a main method inside of there. And then inside my main method, I'm going to be able to create some logic. I'm going to create a while loop in here. So I'm going to create a loop control var variable called count. Uh, actually, I'm going to do a for loop structure. So I'm going to create my variable, but I'm going to set it. I'm not going to initialize it. I'm going to assign it in my for loop. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to evaluate it so long as count is less than 10. I'm going to continue this for loop. And then I'm going to increment it one each time it iterates. Okay, so we have a counter controlled loop. So it makes sense to use a for loop. Here's a question for you, though. Why did I declare on line three and not inside of the for loop block, inside the parentheses? Why do you think I did that? And the answer is that whenever I declare a variable, Java has a built-in garbage collector. So whenever a variable within a particular scope falls out of the set of curly braces, that variable is discarded and I don't have access to it anymore. Does that make sense? 
So if I declared my variable here, let's see what happens if I declare the variable here. If I declare it here, then it starts inside of this scope here, right? So it would start at the end of this curl. So it would, it would exist for lines five and six, but I want to print it out after, after my for loop. I'm sorry, it would exist here. So five, six, seven, and eight. So it would exist inside that block of code between this curly brace here and this curly brace here, the one that starts on, uh, what is that, line five, four, and the one that ends on line nine. But at the very end, I want to be able to print the state of it after everything is said and done, which means that I need to declare the variable inside of that block. Does that make sense? So I'll show you. Let's, let's do this. So here, this is a for loop, but I'm going to declare it inside of the main method scope here where this curly brace is so that I can access it within inside of my main method here. So this is uh, a lot of scoping rules that are important to know, actually. So let's compile that. And let's take a look at the output. So here, what break does is, and let's walk through this. So we're going to start our count at zero. So long as count is uh, less than or equal to 10, we'll increment it. But if count is ever five, then I'm going to tell my, my, uh, my repetition statement to break out, to stop and exit out of the loop and then move on to the next uh, block of statements, which would be line 10. So notice what happens here when I run this is I go zero, one, two, three, four, then five, then count is equal to five. So this break triggers. This break causes me to break out the for loop, regardless of what the Boolean expression is, regardless of what the loop control variable is. And so once I break out this loop here, then I'm going to execute this block, which is going to say the loop breaks at, and then it's going to be that value of five. And again, I want to show you what happens if I don't declare this here. So I'm going to comment out line three. I'm going to do this, and I want you to see what happens. So here, let's go ahead, compile, and notice it won't even let me compile. Why does it not let me compile? It says it cannot find the symbol on line 10. The symbol can't find is count. Whenever it says symbol, it means it can't find a variable named that thing. And it's because this count is declared here to here, and it doesn't exist outside of that block, so I can't access it. So if I want, again, if I want to access it, then I have to declare it in the block of code that I'm trying to access it. Does that make sense? So then I'll declare it here, and then I'll assign it here. Excellent. Okay, does the break statement make sense, everybody? You see how that works? It allows us to define a condition to break out of our for loop. Okay, let me show you the continue statement then, because it works similar, but slightly different. And then I wanna show you how the break statement can be used inside of a switch structure as well after that. Okay, so here we're going to do the same thing. Let me cut this so we can take a look. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define a class continue because it's going to match the file I just created. I'm going to create a main method because all of my statements have to go into a method. So now the statements I'm going to do, I'm going to do a for loop and I want to access my loop control variable after I'm out of the for loop block. So I'm going to declare the loop control variable here on line three. Then I'm going to have my basic for loop structure. So I'm going to assign the value in the first statement. I'm going to define my Boolean expression on the second statement. I'm going to define the loop control variable update in my third statement. Here, I'm going to do the opposite. When count equals five, I'm going to use the continue keyword instead of the break keyword. And then I'm going to then have this statement where I'm going to print out the value of count. And at the very end, after I'm done the for loop, I'm going to show what condition count is when I broke out of the for loop. So let's look at what the output is, and then we'll try to figure out what continues behavior was for us. So let me clear this output. So let me compile this. And let me run this. 
So here, notice the this runs all the way to completion, zero, one, two, three, four. But what continue does is it skips printing five. Why does it print skip printing? And then it does six, seven, eight, nine. So and then I get the loop breaks at ten. So what continue does is if when count is equal to five, continue will advance. It will end this iteration of the loop, but advance to the next state. It doesn't break us out entirely, but we won't execute anything after the continue keyword. Does that make sense? And that's why we never print out line eight for five, because the continue just says, okay, whatever is under this continue, just skip and move on to the next iteration, which is gonna be six. And then six prints out and seven and eight, and then we'll naturally break out of our loop with our normal Boolean expression, which is when count becomes 10. So then our breakout condition was actually 10. So do you see the distinction between break and continue? Excellent. And if not, you can always, you know, send me a, uh, if you're working on code or whatnot, and if you're confused with it, you can always send me a, uh, a question. So the last thing I wanna do is, there's one last control operation we have to cover before we're kind of done the foundational building blocks for our algorithms, for our basic algorithm design. And that's a switch statement. So, so far we've seen selection statements, we've seen repetition statements. Switch statements are actually, they're very similar to multi-selection statements. They're very similar to the nested if else if, so it can allow us to take multiple blocks of code and be able to select one of those blocks to execute from them, but it uses a different syntax. So typically uh, what is preferred in industry is that you use the nested if else structure, but there are instances where switch statements are nice. Uh, and so we'll try to, we'll highlight that in actual examples in future lectures, but let me show you how a switch statement is designed. So switches are a little bit different because they use cases and each case is based off of an equality statement. And so because of that, switches are a little less flexible than the nested if else, because we can do like relational statements and not just equality statements with if else's, right? We can check scopes, say for instance, like when we did the grader, when we were trying to select, determine if something was an A, a B, a C or a D, we could say, if it's greater than 90 or if it's greater than 80, or if it's greater than 70, do you remember that example? With a switch statement, we couldn't do that. We have to check based off of equality and not something that's relative. But it can be very powerful if you have multiple states of something and you wanna do something in response to a state. So uh, we also have to use break statements. So the break I just showed you for repetitions can also be used for switch statements. And I'm gonna show you what happens if we don't. And there's a default case, which is like the default else in a nested if else. Okay, let me just show you some basic examples. And we're gonna look at switch statements again next lecture, but this will whet your appetite for them. So there's two kinds of syntaxes we can use for our switch statements. There's the old classical style. And I wanna show you as of Java 14, they've improved syntax to make switch statements much more user-friendly. And we're, I'm gonna show you both. And so here, let me create, I'll call this switch1.java. Okay, so a quick gander of what's happening with this code. And again, let me cut out here. So here, I'm gonna import my scanner class so that I can get user input so that we can actually play around with different cases. I'm gonna create a class name called switch. I'm gonna create a main method where I can put all my code. Okay, so then let's see what's actually happening with the code. So on line five, I'm gonna create a prompt to the user, enter A or B. And then I'm gonna create a scanner object so that we can get input from the user. I'm gonna call that keyboard. Then I'm gonna get that response from the user in the form of a string. I'm gonna set the selection that the user wants to be an empty string. And then I'm gonna create a switch statement. So a switch statement opens up so like an if does or any of the other control structures, but we use the keyword switch and we pass it the thing we wanna to try to match on. 
So again, this is like an equality. We're trying to match to a particular case. So in this instance, we're going to pass in response, which is going to be whatever the string the user supplied. So if the case is A, so notice we use the case, uh, keyword case, and now it could be a string, it could be an integer, it could be a byte, it could be a car. So it could be any of the uh, numerical data types that aren't approximate values, right? Because you have to actually, you actually have to be equal to, or it could be like, like we see here a string. So if it's an A, and then I use colon, and then I could do a block of code, then I'm going to set my selection to be option A. And then I'm going to break out of that. If I don't put the break statement, then I fall into the next case by default. It doesn't know to end without the break statement. So that's what breaks me out of the switch. Then on a case of B, I'm going to set selection to be option B. And then I'm going to create a break statement. And then my default, if it's not A or B, then I'm going to set selection to be none. And then at the very end, after I'm done the switch statement, I'm either going to have the value of option A, option B, or none. So notice this is a different way of doing a multi-selection statement. And actually, let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like when we run. Oh, let me call this one. And let me run that. So here, enter A or B. So I'm going to hit A. And it's going to say option A. That's what we'd expect. Let's do it again. B, option B. And then finally, let's say like W. That's It's neither A or B. So the default, the catch-all, that's like the else in a nested if else, if else, if, uh, if else block uh, will be the none. Now, let me show you what happens if I forget these break statements. How critical these break statements. What do you think will happen? What's going to happen is it's going to select, it's going to set selection. Let, let me show you. Let's save this. Let me compile because it's a very nuanced thing for getting those breaks. But let me show you how nefarious this is because it still executes. But when I hit A, what do we want to happen? We want it to say option A, right? But when I hit enter, it's going to say selection none. And the reason why is even though case A triggered, I can even put a system. I, I can put a system in here. Let me do a system dot out dot print and I'll put, and let me do print LN. Let me put the um, selection here so that you can see what's actually happening. I think if I, if I put some statements in here, it'll be more intuitive. Without the break statements, it's going to fall through every case the moment it triggers the first case. So let me do that, that. So if I do A, it triggers A, then it triggers B, then it triggers the last one because it doesn't have a break to break out. If I do it again, but select B, it ignores A, but it, it, B, it's equal to, so it's going to trigger that case, but because there's no break case after that, it's also going to trigger everything underneath it. So that's, it's very, switch statements can be very dangerous for this reason. But because of that, they improved it. Let me show you the improved version of a switch statement I can also ignore the, the default case. Like a default case potentially is also optional. I don't need it. So let me show you what it looks like without the default case. And then I want to show you the improved syntax. So here, if I do A, notice I'll trigger A, B. Because I don't have those break statements. So here, I'll just do the B. And here, if I don't have anything, my selection is nothing, right? So the default allows me to catch a situation where I don't match any case, but I still want to have a default behavior. So some value that's appended to there. Usually it's like an error message. So here, let me show you this one last thing, the syntax, the newer syntax for the very same code and how much more readable this is. And I just want to execute it so that you can see it in practice. So here, the, Line five is the same, line six, seven, eight. The difference is just a switch statement. So instead of using the case and then a colon and then a break statement, we can use an arrow symbol instead of the colon symbol to define what our statement is instead. You see that? And that's much more, and that, that implicitly gives us the break. So if I use this newer syntax, which is preferred, 
we're going to get the behavior we expected before without having to worry about breaks. So if I hit A, notice it just gives me option A. No break statements, but I'm not falling through. And let me show you that again with option B. I just get the option B. And if I do anything else like a T, it gives me the none. I get the behavior I had for the correct way statement without all of the headache and potential of, uh, of, of forgetting the break and causing erroneous behavior. So if you use switch statements, please use the newer syntax, but please also understand the book, unfortunately, is with Java 8. So if you look at the book syntax, it only has the older syntax, which is what the type you don't want to use any longer. This is a much improved expression that is now can be more readily adopted in industry. They, they've really improved this since the textbook was released. So I, I wanted to highlight that for everyone, because if you look at the textbook, it's completely wrong. You want to move to this newer approach. Excellent. Before I let everyone go, is there any questions? Excellent. Well, we've done a good, uh, we made some good progress today. We've discussed all five fundamental uh, building blocks we need for algorithms. I want to start building some basic algorithms in class and walking through that process. So you can start seeing how you can start thinking about designing your own algorithms. So we'll do that on Thursday. With that said, uh, between now and then, I'll, I'll start grading your first homework so that you have grades and move. And again, don't forget to go onto Discord and put that you've attended today's class if you didn't have a computer. And you should also have access to the YouTube playlist as well. If you don't, let me know if it's not uh, working. And as soon as this, this uh, uh, lecture is done processing, I'll add it on as well. It'll be easy to update now that I have the playlist set up. Well, okay, everyone have a great day. See you guys on Thursday. <laughs>